All right, so one of the things, okay, so Book of Romans, we've been talking about all the different lessons to it, right? And so who can remember what chapter one's about? Remember, we have them listed here. Do you want me to just read right through there and you just follow along? Okay, all right. So it says, so once we have began to study this book, we found out that, uh, that uh, it breaks down all the introduction to good, sound Christian doctrine. So tonight is chapter 12. So let's review the key truths to each chapter. Chapter 1 is about what happens when humans reject God. Chapter 2 is about the religious people judging others and practicing sin, the same thing. You know, the Bible says judge not, right? Chapter 3 is the earthly answer, for all have come short of the glory of God. So we've all sinned and come short. So it doesn't matter if we're religious, non-religious. If we don't have Jesus in our heart, we're in trouble. Can you say amen? And chapter 4 tells us how to get God in our life. By faith, right? Chapter 4 says how it is by believing in God by faith that makes us righteous. Amen? And death, okay? And then even before the law and afterward, remember Abraham before the law, David afterward, they both have faith in God and they were accounted for righteous. Chapter 5 tells us the problem, shows us how sin entered mankind and death by sin by the free gift of one action of one righteous man, Jesus Christ, all became righteous to have their faith in him. Remember, we are two people. There's an old person, that's our flesh, and there's that new person, amen, that new creation in Christ, amen? Who's running your life? Now in chapter six, we are to be dead to sin, Sin in the singular means sin nature. Sins means sin by action of the sin nature. It says, but alive in God through Christ. The great exchange, it's called. In chapter 7, we see Paul bearing his heart. How that the Jewish nation, they believed they were married to the law. And when they found out that they could have Jesus Christ and get freed from the law, they were thinking that they were going through a divorce and were often treated as if they were dead. Paul's found out that he was defeated just trying to follow the law. His struggles, even though I want to be good, what was present? Yeah, his flesh. Even though I wanted to do good, he said it this way, evil was present with me. Remember Jesus talked to his disciples, and he said this. He says, which of you being evil can give good gifts to your children. Now, if you were like me, why is he calling his disciples evil? Makes sense, huh? Good answer, simple answer. Nobody was born again yet, right? So who did they have? They only had faith in God, so they had a flesh that was full of evil. Evil. So even though they believed in Christ, their flesh was evil. So when Jesus looked at him and said the truth, which of you being evil could do good things to your children? They knew. Because of Adam's sin, they were evil. But they wanted to be good. See, Paul, I want to be good, but evil is what? present with me. I hope you got that. Let's go on to chapter 8. What's, we broke it down into two. Freedom that's in Christ and the victory we have walking with him. The resurrection power that's only in Christ liberated us from sin and death, translated us into God's kingdom in Christ, and we are adopted sons and daughters of the king. Say amen, somebody. God is now working out the flaws in our life, working with us. We're teaming up. Sit down, he says, yoke up with me, learn my ways. And then it says, you'll find rest of your souls. Let's learn together. So we're walking out life together. Let's, let's see it as we all have faults, but instead of judging one another, Father gave us all things in Christ. Chapter 9, what was it about? 
we see Israel's rejection of Jesus Christ, which served God's purpose. Can you remember what this purpose was when Israel rejected Christ? What did it open the door to? And what did it quicken? Bueller. It just opened up the door to remember the Gentiles. We got favored quicker and faster because they were stiff-necked rejected Christ. Can you say amen? Remember, he left the house of Israel and he went to the sea of the Gentiles because they rejected him. So chapter 9, Paul bears his heart. Okay? We see Israel's rejection. It worked out for our good. This grieved Paul that the fleshliness of the Israelites and their pride actually quickened God's plan for us. Chapter 10, we see Israel's problem. They had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They went about to establish their own righteousness, because they were Jewish. Jesus Christ then ended the law and said, you must have faith in me, right? So they continued to reject. Chapter 11, we see that Israel's rejection of Jesus Christ worked for our good. Yet their rejection of Christ was not uh, at the end, it wasn't the end of everything. There was a remnant of them which believed. There still is today. You can see them. They're completed, we call them completed Jews. And they're born again, spirit-filled Jewish people that are born Jew, but they have gotten completed because they have picked out Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Amen. All right, so chapter 11 is really about how God's favored that. There was a remnant of them. What's going to happen? When is God, God going to finish his dealings with Israel? Can you remember what that's called? Tribulation. Tribulation. Jacob's trouble, remember? God is really grieved about the Jewish nation. And the time of the Gentiles, the church age, comes into operation. Then the rapture takes us away. Then the earth goes into seven years again of tribulation, Jacob's trouble, where God finishes his dealings with Israel. Okay? And God judges the world and the nations on how they treated Israel and Christians. Now, this is my speculation. In heaven, it talks about 24 elders that sit around the throne. 12 from where and 12 from where? Well, if there's only two kinds of believers back then, what? Pretty close. Jews and Gentiles. Okay? Okay? 20, 12 apostles, 12 Gentile apostles, 24 elders from every race and everything that he could line out. Now, we might go to heaven to discover that there was a little bit different than what I said. But it's my speculation that God includes everybody. He's always planned to include Gentiles. But he had to say that salvation is first to the Jews and also to the Gentiles or the Greeks. All right, you with me? All right, so our point, chapter 12. Everyone go, dun da 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 What's it about? Three main things. So read along with me under point here. Here in chapter 12, we will see how to be a living sacrifice to God. Serving with our motivational gifts and understanding how they work, even in others. Finally, the love-motivated behavior of you and I as believers. How should we act at church and how especially outside of church should we be acting? How many know it should be the same? Yeah. All right. So we're, those are your three main themes in Romans chapter 12. All right. But we're going to open up. You go to Romans 12, and I'm going to open up with this text in James chapter 1, 22 through 25, reminds us to be what? Doers of the word. Okay. All right. Now that's a key because no matter how much we believe in God, how much we are good people, if we don't practice the word, we're not going to grow. Remember, God came into you complete. Now, 
If I can explain this, I hope I can, and for those on camera. God came into our heart complete, kind of like a seed. But you and I have to exercise our faith in the word, in life, for Christ whose muscles have to be toned and patience have to be developed. So say, I have all the patience I need. It's developing. So it's perfect patience that is growing in you. Okay? It's perfect love. God. He's growing in you. Now God is not growing up like a baby God. He's, he's developing in tone structure. For example, if you happen to break your arm like I did, then you have to have it in a cast for so long back then. And then you lose your muscle tone. You don't lose your muscles unless they take them out. You lose the muscle tone. So you have to retone your muscles. That's what our walk's all about. You and I are walking with Jesus through life. And Jesus is developing our spiritual muscles. So we are growing into perfection. Through God's help, not our own. Can you say amen? All right, so let's look at this. James again says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving our, yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man observing his natural, remember human face, in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and imme immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Hello. If you see yourself as God sees you in the morning, okay, then you get up and then you look at yourself like in a mirror or you look at the problem and you forget who you were at the beginning of the day and you look at the problem, you'll forget who you were. That's the whole trick of the enemy is to get us to be in a state of mind. We forget what we know. We forget who we are. And we forget who's with us. Now, that's not saying we're sinning. It's just simply, it's saying that we need to get that discipline in us so it's on our mind. And that's the whole purpose of encouraging everyone to meet with God first thing, is to keep God on the mind first. So he can remind us throughout the day. You start your day off, even though we're good, you're good people, you start your day out without checking up. It's kind of like the guy who gets in the car, drives to work, and looks down, he's driving on empty. And he's only halfway to work. He's stuck in traffic. Now you do this, no preparation. We meet with God, get our preparation for the day so everything can be taken in peace. He will keep him in perfect peace, Isaiah 26, 3, whose mind is stayed on him. Are you still with me? So be a doer of the word. Not, you're like a man observing in the natural face in a mirror and observing himself goes away and forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, that's your Bible, and continues in it. See, there's the key. Continuing in it. He not being a forgetful hearer. How many know that as you continue in it, it becomes easier to remember? You're not trying to remember. It just becomes a part of you. A lot of people say to me, how do you remember all those scriptures? I have not practiced remembrance once. You just get familiar by going to them, reading them out loud, you're quoting them, you know, the best way you can and rereading them, and oh, there it is, and it just seems to come alive that way. It probably worked that way for you too. Amen? Familiarize yourself and continue in it. He's not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one, the one that does the word, not just hear it, this one will be blessed, listen, in what he does. Didn't say only certain things. It says everything you do. Got the priorities all lined up. Can you say amen? All right, how to be a living sacrifice. Everyone say, teach me, teach me Apostle Paul. Okay, the Romans chapter 12 in your notes there. We're going to look at the first three verses, and we're going to break it down for you. 
Okay. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. The word beseech there in the Greek is a real strong term. He says, if I could just beg you to get this point. He says, you as a Christian, get this point. Brethren, remember God is merciful that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, set apart, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Okay, let's break it down for you. You present your body. We have a problem there. You and your body. What's the problem? There's two different. Now you're seeing, the Bible points it out. There's you, your spirit and soul, and then there's a bod, your body, which is your machine. Listen, your car works for you. You don't get in your car and it says, this is where we're going, buddy. <laughs> Yet, that's what happens to you if you don't pray. Your car tells you where to go. And it might not be pretty. Let's move right past that. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, thank God he's merciful, that you, the spirit soul man, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, set apart for God, acceptable to God. How do we become holy and acceptable? Remember what I told you? When you meet with God, you get in there, God shuts your flesh down. You said, Lord, here it is. Do something with it. I mean, literally, just say that. And God says, okay, I'll start shutting it down. Just start telling him you love him. And just kind of open your heart to him. And you just shut your flesh right on down. You don't shut your flesh down. He shuts it down. But you got to stay in there long enough. Might be 10, 15 minutes to soak in there, shut that thing down. And then you, you'll tell it's shutting down because your mind will start to relax. If you're not careful, remember you control your mind, you'll fall asleep. You don't want to fall asleep. You want to relax. So the things of your spirit wiggle right up under the eyes of your understanding. And suddenly you're having visions and thoughtful ideas that you didn't have before. What, what's happening? You are being rejuvenated. You're being plugged in. Your spirit man is a soaring in the presence of God. Your soul is, is getting ideas coming up from your spirit. Your mind is shutting down. And your flesh is just kind of shut there. You present your body. That's what happens. Now, if you don't present your body, you're going to take that broken piece of machinery everywhere you go that day. And if you're not careful, careful, somebody's going to say something to you, irritate you. But if you have taken care of that business, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Do you have another translation here tonight? Reasonable service? Spiritual worship is one. Anybody? Did you got your uh, message up there, Derek? No. Okay. Give me one that says something different. Which is your reasonable service? Which is your what? Spiritual worship is one. And yeah, actually in the Greek, a decisive dedication, but actually what it means in the Greek is this is what you have to do to have any kind of success during the day. You have to, it's, it's reasonable that you present yourself to God so he can do a good job with you. If it's very unreasonable to yourself, if you can't present your body a living sacrifice, you're going to have a bad day or could have a bad day. Are you with me? Yeah. It's a reasonable, rationally intelligent thing to do. Do something with your flesh before it does something with you. Amen. Makes sense, right? But you know those people in Rome, they had no teaching. They had no idea. We get spoiled here. Most people didn't even know there was a spirit, soul, and a body. 
You know there's a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. But you know there's 60% of the whole church around the world doesn't understand that man is a three-part being. And because they don't understand it, they think that nasty part of them, that's their flesh, is part of the package. And for some reason, God left it with them so that it could remind them how to stay humble. You see how dumb that kind of teaching is? They don't address it. They don't point it out. They don't teach. The reason why I teach like this and put it in segments is for our understanding only. I mean, for heaven's sakes, I don't look at me as three-part being. But I do know when I read the scripture and have certain feelings and emotions, I know which is doing what. Can you say amen? I don't go, oh, God, why are you allowing this? Boo, boo, boo. You just open your mouth, Job. And said you had no knowledge. All right, let's move right on. I don't want to meddle. Okay, so he goes on. And he says, now, and do not. You present your body. You do what's reasonable. What's, what's the obvious thing you need to do? And do not. Don't do this. Do not be conformed to this world. Take a look at the churches nowadays. You can't tell them the difference between them and the world. They're trying to worldly things and worldly this and worldly that. How many know God? Jesus didn't, didn't try any worldly things. In fact, that's why they killed him. He didn't fit in. But everything he did was supernatural. That's who we are. We're going to get in with the supernatural. You want to see Jesus? Boom, he shows right on up, heals them of cancer. That our faith, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, that our faith not be in the wisdom of men, but in the demonstration of the power of God. Hello? Because there's a lot of p- fancy preachers out there who can preach a nice message. Sounds good. Couldn't figure out what they're saying, but it sounds real good. Big words. And I'm not trying to put them down, but you need something that's going to work. Just good, clear understanding of the word. Jesus didn't go, oh, indubitably, I want to explain the examination of the, the forelonged. So can you pay attention to what I'm saying? Oh, no. <laughs> you see, they were fishermen. Jesus knew how to talk to fishermen. And, and tax collectors and sinners. Amen. All right, so we're going on. So. He says, be not conformed. Don't be pressed down into the world. Be like them. But be it transformed. We get the word metamorphosize. Okay, it's the same thing as a butterfly coming out of a cocoon. Your body's a cocoon, folks. The butterfly is your spirit and your soul. Are you beating your way out of the inside of your flesh? Or is your flesh so hard like a shell and hasn't cracked off yet? There are Christians that have been 30, 40 years as carnal as the world. They do love God. They'll cry when they mention Jesus. But their old hard shells never fell off. So let's move on past that. <laughs> are you talking to me? No, I'm not talking about you. So says, do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Something to do with this little mind here. Where you put it, where you focus, what you put in it is going to cause your transformation. Right? How many know that the money you put in your bank account is going to transform your finances? Hello? So, it will transform your mind. By the renewing of mind, that you may, now look at the word prove. That word prove there, examine and demonstrate. You look at something, oh, that's how you do it, and then you demonstrate it. God wants you to examine him, study his word, and do what it says. Hello. And they, disciples, went everywhere, it says. And the Lord confirming the word with them. Are we preaching the word? Are we just talking about the problem? Say amen or oh me. So, 
quickly again, and do not be pressed into the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why God's got a different set of rules that you may prove, examine, and demonstrate what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. 30, 60, 100 fold. How many know when you first get saved, you find out it's good. And then when you start to get a little full of yourself again, you start to find out what's acceptable and what's not. And then God begins to guide you. And then when you get to the, that point, you find out what really is the will of God for your life. And you can get on with it. Can just say amen. Four points. Point one. Paul beseeches us to present our bodies. A living sacrifice. It means it never fully dies. How many know Adam died spiritually and then died physically? God is merciful through Christ. So we present our flesh before God. And his mercy, he adjusts it. This is our reasonable. This is what he asked for us. Anybody with a reasonable mind, bring your body before me so he can make it set apart. He can shut it down and make it acceptable to him. So then when you take your body, your earth suit, around during the day, you're not going to be an embarrassment. Especially to God. Moving right along, two, we are, it's reasonable, it's reasonable service what's required by God. How many know God's always reasonable? Oh, yeah. Never ask anything too hard. And if it seems hard, he's going to help you do it. Thirdly, don't act like the world, but rather live out what God's will is for you. You have it inside you. The good, the acceptable and the perfect will of God. Not the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> I used to be able to go, woo, 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 with my, my hands. I can't do it anymore. I made it sound just like that. We went to the movie, and I started practicing. I can't do it anymore anyway. So it's funny. How? By renewing our mind. Folks, we have to be in the Word a little bit every day. Why? It acts like a standard. How many know if you get up from your bed and you fall over, you didn't get your land legs going? You have to get stable. Can you say amen? When we put our head in the word, when we, we go to the word with God's help, it stabilizes us. Because it's, it's like the plumb bob, like the level line to, to building anything. When you just stick your head into the word of God just for a couple minutes, Look, read a proverb, read, read a promise, and just speak it out loud and talk to God about it. It just seems to put everything in perspective, especially, especially if your head's really heavy with a lot of stuff you shouldn't be dwelling on. All right, so how do we, we, how do we get ourselves in a position of change, renewing your mind? Amen. Okay, first point. Serving God through motivational gifts. I love this particular part of the Bible. One of my favorites. Everyone say, what motivates me? Have you ever noticed everybody's different and what mo motivates them? Some are similar, some are not so similar. Like somebody will look at a dish and they'll go, well, that's fantastic. And somebody else will look at that dish and go, eh, I can do that at home. And if you're not careful and you don't understand the motivational gifts operating in people, you, you'll like, oh, what's going on here? So a lot of times Christians don't understand why they feel or look at something a different way. Or why somebody in the church responds completely different than they would have. Remember, I always use that expression that sometimes if somebody in the world lies a little bit, they have this assumption that everybody does that. You know, so well, I lie a little bit. You must too. No. Can, hello. So we have this tendency to look at this kind. So serving God through the motivational gifts. What motivates you? Well, now it should be the love of God. But there are certain things that you like. Others may not like so much. And certain things that get to you that it doesn't even bother other people. That's why it's not a good thing to think that your way's the best way. Everybody else is flawed. 
Well, we're all flawed, so let's find out these motivational gifts, shall we? All right, Romans chapter 12, starting with 3 through 6. Serving God through motivational gifts and enjoying them as well. All right, so Romans 12 verse 3 says, For I say through the grace, everyone say grace, given to me, he says, to everyone who's among you, look around, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. So go, na 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 na. I'm better than you. No, we're not. You see, the whole thing sounds crazy, right? So, of course, in other words, we need to be thinking right, especially if we're going to be with people, right? So listen, he says, God has given grace to everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than he ought to, but to think soberly or soundly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So let me say this with you. God has special grace and special faith for my gift. He has general grace and general faith for every believer. But see, every believer doesn't have the same function. You might be an arm. I might be a leg. You might, Joe, be, be an eye. Uh, Jenny might be a foot. So we have faith and grace designed for your gift. Can you say amen? Plus what you have at Calvary. So you have a special, what I call, grease grace. Yeah, your wheel gets a little squeaky in your gift. What I have is not going to bless you unless it's going to give you advice. You need the grace that God has given you for that gift to seek him and have him lubricate that gift in you. Can you say amen? And we're going to break them down just to, for definition and look at some of these great things. But let's read on. Look at what it says. And not to think more highly, God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members... In one body, remember there's only one. Some people are so hung up on different bodies. One body, but all members do not have the same function. I cannot walk. A hand cannot talk. You see? And when we start trying to do what we're not supposed to be doing, we frustrate the grace of God. And we don't want to do that. So let's go on. All right? Member, many members in one body, and he says now, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we need to learn to enjoy each other's gifts. Right? Can you imagine what it would be like if you, you don't enjoy your wife's gifts or your husband's gifts? Hello? Or have a talk to him about it. <laughs> no. But God put us all together. Now, this is why I believe this. I believe God grows the church. I believe churches grow. But if God is growing a good, healthy church, no matter what the size is, he's going to put members in the body as it pleases him. And each member is going to have different grace gifts and motivational gifts that are going to complement the others. For example... Somebody with giving. There's always a giver in every size of church. So that, that if they operate in love, operate for God, that there'll never be a need in that church, even how small or big, because there's always God's givers in there. So let's go through this a little more and find out, okay? So we being many are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. Four points underneath that. Number one. We are not to think of ourselves. Stop right there. <laughs> that took care of that, didn't it? More highly than we ought to think, okay? But to think soberly, right? How's this person reacting to what I'm saying? That's a sober thought. Um, me walking outside in my underwear, is that going to offend anybody? Yeah. That's a sober thought. You know, analyzing not only what you're doing, but analyzing how you're coming across to other people. You know what I mean? It's important, right? 
And not only that, but certain people operate a different way. Like, for example, I'm a leader, just by my definition. But if you look at what I do, I lead. And, you know, leaders are not always pleasant people, especially if things aren't getting done. They lead. They don't pamper and, oh, poor little thing. Everybody wants them to. Huh? What happens if you got a president like that? Moving right along. All right. Now, now listen. It's a, remember, <laughs> I, I love this, okay. It says, we are many members. Three, in the body, these grace gifts and each of one of us operate to make one functional body, to bless it, to make it whole. That's why when people skip church and they don't bother to seek God and they're serious, God is trying to put together a whole church that functions properly. And if, it, if all the living stones decide one day not to hang out, then you're going to have holes in the walls, you know, just to be fun of it. And then fourthly, there are eight, excuse me, there are seven grace gifts, not eight. I put eight down, but it's seven. Grace motivational gifts we can um, define for you. So we can see, so you can see yourself and see them in other people too. All right. So the next point is the grace motivational gifts. Romans 12, 6 through 9. All right. Now I could be here for weeks on this. So I'm just going to give you the, the basics, okay? You take it from here. All right, so in verse 6, Romans 12, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If you're not so graceful, you're going to be used just a little bit. If you're more graceful, you're going to be used a whole lot. Let us use them according to how well we use them. Can you say amen? If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion of our faith. Or ministry. Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives in, in uh, liberty, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Can you say amen? Now, there's pros, good, and there's negatives of each one of these. I'm going to stay mostly to the positives, but I am maybe throw a negative in at the end, okay? The word prophecy means to declare truth. So this is a person who can't keep declare, from declaring truth. They will always tell you how they feel. Sometimes when you don't ask. A person with a, a, a declaring truth gift, true gift, will declare what's wrong with something, will declare what needs to be correct. They're a truth giver. Hello. How many know, though, when you speak the truth, you speak the truth in what? Love. love. So the more truth you are, the more love you need to speak it in. All right, so we have Carrie coming in, and I have a beautiful chocolate cream pie. I trip on the rug right there, bless its heart, and I fall, and it goes all over everything. We're going to look at every one of these gifts, how they would respond to a simple incident like that. So somebody who declares truth is going to look at that, they're not going to hardly do anything. And they're going to say, I can tell you why that happened. Now, you don't want to hear from necessarily that kind of person. Mm -hmm. That's true. You need some of the other gifts operating. Mm -hmm. The person's already on the floor. The mess is already made. He doesn't need to be told how it happened. So that kind of person needs to know when to speak and when not to speak. Say amen. Amen. The clearer of truth. All right, let's move on to the second one, ministry. Ministry is really a server. Somebody likes to just, oh, you got, oh, let me get you a pencil. Oh, oh let me get you a juice. Uh, like, for example, Amanda's a good one. Joe's another one. You know, you guys are mostly all servers. Denise is another good one. They, they look to serve. So it's ministering, really. How many know that Martha was a minister? She ministered the house and got it ready for the meetings, right? 
There was a lot of people that ministered. Ushers are ministry, okay? Ministry is serving. So how does that work in a body? A serving person looks for the opportunity to help and support. They often will forget that they need help themselves. You see a good a server or minister will have his own cupboards a mess, but go fix somebody else's. Hello. I mean, just, it happens. We need balance in it all. So a good minister, a uh, person of ministers, they, they look for opportunities to help and support. There are a hand and a good worker within a church. Hello. They straighten chairs, whatever's needed. And the Bible says in Proverbs, you know, be diligent in whatever you do, and God will promote you. Right? Don't sit around and watch people work. Say, what can I do to help? Maybe you can't do a whole lot, but you can do something. You could be a leader. Hey, pick that up. (laughs) All right. Did that help you? So a minister, you see him serving all the time. One of the negative things is they can be a workaholic and not rest, not do things properly. So we'll move off of that to the third one. Next one is teaching. So how would a server see Carrie, who spilled the pie, what would a server say to me when the pie is all over the floor? Let me help you clean it up. That's pretty simple, right? Now we move to the teacher. The teacher gives advice constantly. In so much, he instructs, often overthinks something, gives steps and ways in which to do things better, Talks too much. These are just some of the little things, okay? Just looking at that. So how would a teacher look at Carrie's pie on the floor? Well, a teacher says, well, I can give you four steps. And how that will never happen again. Just follow those steps. And let me explain. You're sitting there, pie all over you. you I'm, Carrie's sitting there going... You want to explain to me now? Huh? And you want to tell me why it happened? I like you. You want to help me pick it up. All right, that moves us down to the exhorter. The exhorter. Now, exhorters are often misunderstood because they're like a cheerleader, okay? An exhorter challenges, cheers people on, often will confront in an outspoken way. We'll often tell you what you need to be doing and doing it now. You need to get off that pew and come on down to the altar. Let's go for God. You see, the exhorter. They don't mean anything bad by it. They just figure you need a good push. You're on the edge of that diving board when everybody's there on the ladder saying, jump, jump, and now they're coming out to get you. The exhorter. Huh? Can you see any of these gifts within you? Operating, motivating you? An exhorter. How would the exhorter, well, how would he see that pie and carry? Well, the exhorter will say, get up. Don't sit there and feel sorry for yourself. (laughs) If you would stop fiddling around, come on over here and help this guy. Huh? And next thing you know, if you're not careful, an exhorter will divide the church on who should be helping and who's not. Yeah. Let's move on. Then we, so the exhorter, it's really a blessing. Can you say amen? amen? Now, I find that many of these are in me as a leader. You might have quite a few of these yourself pops out one, once in a while. In a small church, it seems to more pop out. Hello, are everybody still okay tonight? <laughs> All right. All right, so next one comes the giver, right? They love to give. They love to support. In fact, givers, if they're not careful, they'll have some missionary come in, and they'll stop supporting their normal church, and they'll go support that because they just love to support. No brains, but they're just supporting. You know what I mean? They have brains, though. 
givers. They give. They support. Huh? It fuels the resources. That's no problem, you know? And how do they deal with it? Carrie's messy pie. Don't worry, Carrie. I'll buy you another one. Huh? Boy, we need some more of those. <laughs> All right, let's move right up. All right, so now they come to somebody, leadership. All right. We know what the person declaring the truth will do. I can tell you why that happened. The ministry, I'll help you clean it up. The teaching, I'll give you four points. I'll not, never happen again. The exhorter says, get up, don't feel sorry for yourself. And the giver says, I'll buy you another pie. Now the leader. There's one who's in charge. Not think they're in charge. They're in charge. Instructs others on what to do. When to do it. How to do it. It's just leadership. Don't hold it against us. <laughs> but get it done. <laughs> Sorry. Amen. So, okay. All right. So, how to do things. They viewed as bossy. Sometimes they're uh, matter-of-fact people. They don't have any compassion. Those leaders when really we're trying to get a thing done, the overall compassion. They're not really into details. Leaders want the job done. They don't want to know the details. Well, I'm a rare leader. I want to know what are you going to do to do it? And when is it going to be done? Don't tell me you do it and then forget. Hello, any of those things. And then finally we get to the last gift. Well, what does the leader tell? What does the leader, how, how does the leader handle the pie and carry? You get the broom, you go buy them the pie, you stop sitting there and feel sorry for yourself, get up, we can all work into this deal, and the leader starts taking charge. Okay? You want a leader who knows what to do. Where is the fire door? You know? Right, you follow what I'm saying? Where are we headed? I'm amazed as your pastor, nobody's ever asked me, what is our vision, where are we headed? I, of course, I have a long time ago. But we have new people now. Is somebody going to encourage them to ask? <laughs> Where's this boat going? Oh, no, I don't want to go there. You know, you're, you know, I'm just joking. So finally, the mercy gift, right? The gift in the tender feeler of the body of Christ. The one who listens, offers the rebuttal when somebody's being talked about. Oh, but they, they'll get through it. He's really, a, you know. Mercy gifts are really needed. They're really needed. Okay? They're, they're willing to encourage somebody. They have sort of a way about them. It's like a mom. People can cry and they can release. And it's just a good old thing. That mercy person's right there, you know. Also, they have a tendency to collect dogs and stray people. You know, and things, if they're not careful, you know, most mercy people are hoarders, okay? Hello, I didn't know that. Somebody pointed it out to me. Something new I learned. Anyway, so how does a mercy person look at Carrie's spilt pie? Oh, brother, I've been there too. Let me, let me tell you about my time in 1924 when I dropped a whole chest full of on somebody's toe. It was a broken day. See, they get right into the empathy, right into the thing, and if they're not careful, they'll both be sobbing and, and thinking about the problem so much, and it doesn't really cure anything. Hello? But they are the feelers of the body, and they're needed. Because somebody's liable to feel all alone, and the feeler get up and go over and sit down and pray with somebody. So every one of these are very important within a local body. And if you think about it, we have every one of these in this little body here. Are you with me? And you might be two or three of them at times. I know which one Peggy is. I'm joking with you, Peggy. All right, let's move on. Christ-like behavior. Now we're going to move into behavior. 
Now, most of you know that we're supposed to be like Christ, correct? Why don't we run around, I'm going to tell you this, maybe you didn't know. Why don't we run around and tell everybody we're Christian? I, I don't recommend you do that. The word Christian means Christ-like. And you're not there yet. So, so say I'm a believer. It's a better word for you. Because people didn't call back in the day. They didn't call themselves Christians. They called themselves believers. I know it seems like I'm straight and that and that. But it says they were first called Christians in the book of Acts in Antioch. Others called them Christ-like. Don't call yourself Christ-like. Call yourself a believer. You're under constructions, yeah. I'm a foreigner. Oh, I could be, an alien can mean anything. If they called you an alien, this has probably meant you're strange or different. Who knows? I mean, for example, alien means foreign to what is normal, okay? So if you are born in a different country and you come to America, and you're an alien to America. But if you stay here long enough, you'll be an American. You see what I'm saying? If somebody wasn't born on this planet, they would be alienated or aliens from this planet, right? Well, the Bible says we're an alienated from the commonwealth. In other words, we weren't Jewish, so we were Gentile. We're aliens to them. But nowadays, you use the word alien, they think you're a little gray, about four and a half foot tall, big, big almond eyes. No, that's just a demon, sorry. That's, they don't try, I don't... Aliens don't come from other planets to this planet. They've been here all along. They're called demons and the fallen nature of things. And they're just getting everybody's... Same, thing, same old spook used to be the leprechauns back in the, in the teens. Way back in past then, they had all kinds of fairies and other little... Same little creatures. And I'm going to say this as, even though it sounds off the wall. For those of you who are into science... God won't let anybody come from another planet to this one because there's a spiritual virus and outlaw on this one and he doesn't want them jumping ship and taking them somewhere. So I'll just tell you, if you don't believe me, go to God about it. That's why nobody's going to Mars or nobody's going all that drawn out there, going to be seeing all these alien people. No, right now we've got a war going on between the souls of men. So let's go on. Paul's stepping out here. Are you with me? Christ-like behavior. Okay. Romans 12, 9 through 21. Let love be without hypocrisy. Speaks for itself, doesn't it? Be real. I just wonder about these people who slap you on the back and tell you they love you. And then two weeks later, they're, they're mad at you and you never see them anymore. I, that's why I tell people, don't tell me all the, what you love me and all this kind of stuff. Because show me. If you love God, show him. Don't just tell him all the time. Show him. Because it sounds braggadocious, you know. But if you're going to love people, be real. Can you say amen? A poor which is evil. Abortion is evil. Wars, evil. Hating one another is evil. People should know where you're at. They can't tell you, and you're a Christian, what you like and what you don't like, then you are too compromised. Okay? Be kindly affectionate one to another. How many know when you're kindly affectionate one another, you have to overlook faults? Somebody's rudeness. Okay? With brotherly love. You see, brotherly love, I love, my sister was really ornery, but I really loved her. And I think she really loved me, despite all the duking it out and chasing me around with butcher knives and all that kind of thing. You know, I had a wonderful childhood. Okay? Throwing me down the stairs once. Thank God I landed pretty cool. All right. So now, it says, kindly affection with brotherly love, in honor giving preference. You see, if we honor one another, instead of trying to get our attention... 
but we just start honoring people, people will feel honored and they'll want to honor other people. And it'll be an affection honoring one another. Respect is very, very important. Showing people respect. Hey, if you've lived on this planet longer than 50 years, you deserve respect. You might be honorary and all get out, but you have my respect. You didn't die early. <laughs> can you say amen? So there's respect that can be given. Even though, for example, a father, you're a pretty decent father. Right? You have my respect. You see, you can respect somebody if they're doing their best. Showing disrespect is terrible because that's what Satan does. Everything is good he shows disrespect to. Let's go on. It says, honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence. Joe's a good person. He's always busy. Fervent in spirit, having a great attitude. Serving the Lord. A great attitude. Oh, I got an answer today. <laughs> Sit home. You know, come on. You don't get a dime or nothing. If you're serving God with a bad attitude, I mean, you don't get a re any rewards. Stay home. Come to the altar and repent. Patient in tribulation, right? Continuing steadfast in prayer. How many know you hear something? Since I heard about BJ, start praying. As soon as you hear about something, just start praying. Don't wait. Oh, we'll get together to the next prayer meeting on Thursday or four on Friday. Don't. Pray now. At this moment. It takes a second. Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, I put that, I don't know exactly what to pray. I put the whole thing in your hands. Good enough. Okay? All right. Steadfast in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints. We do that here. Amen. Given to hospitality. Hey, come Sunday. Hang out afterwards. You guys are wonderful at it. Just don't let it become a click. Somebody, I know you won't, but if somebody new comes in, make sure that they are part. Stop all the other conversations and make sure they feel important. Can you say amen? Bless those that persecute you. You were never meant to curse anyone. Never, ever, 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 ever. And yet at one time in my life, I was cursing the devil and I was cursing, you know, the head shops and the satanic covenants. And I got myself in big trouble. I, I, and I said, what am I doing wrong? He says, I already cursed them. Just say, I said that the Lord curses you. When you say the Lord curses you, you're saying the same thing with me and you got all heaven behind you. If you say, I curse you, then you're just saying, I curse you. And if you got me not backing you, then you're setting yourself up, son. You get it? Who do we fight? How do we fight? We project God to the forefront of ourselves and let him do the punching. Can you say amen? amen? We let him do the punching while we do the resting. You know, that's why Jesus said, somebody slaps you on one cheek, turn to him the other. He wasn't saying, just let him beat you up. He's saying, when you recess, I progress. When you progress, I recess. Let me say it a better way. When you're out front, I'm out back. When, I, when you're out back, I'm up front. So as long as you want to be the showman, I'll wait until you're all beat up. Not really. I'll wait until you're done. Now let me do the fighting for you. Now you think about it. Jesus already won. So the time he shows up, there you have all the scriptures that says God arrives, enemy runs. Let light rise, darkness flees. See, then all those scriptures come into operation. The only time that we're supposed to be involved is when we believe like I bind the devil. Okay? You can do that. But you don't look at the devil and say, I curse you. No, I believe what Jesus believed and you are cursed. You see the difference? That way you're not sowing anything in the flesh that he can come back on. All right, moving past that. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Somebody's sad? Sit down and, and be compassionate. Somebody got a new car or something? I mean, have a parade. Amen. Oh, yeah, we don't want 
We don't want to tell anybody that was a good job. We don't puff up their head. Who gave you the right to be God? It says to rejoice with them. Hello? And if somebody's brokenhearted, sit down and, and let them feel your compassion. All right, we know that. I don't preach myself happy, okay? All right, it says, weep with the weep, you know. And then it goes on, it says, be of the same mind one towards another. Do not set your mind on high things. Boy, I can't wait till the church is 100,000 people. I'll be all over TV. No. But associate with the humble. Good, smart Christians or smart believers are like Jesus. He hung out with the humble. He didn't hang out with any of the Pharisees or anything. You notice that? They're the ones that stood on the street corners and they had all of the Rolls Royces and the, the Rolex watches and the four cars in the garage that nobody knows about. You know, I'm a preacher. Yeah, you're not taking it with you, buddy. Amen. So it was a prophet. Okay, so then he goes on and he says, do not be wise in your own opinion. How many know that's true? And boy, have I, I have to work on that one. Don't say anything, dear. Repay no man evil for evil. Why? As you sow, you reap. Have regard to the good things in the sight of all men. Boy, isn't that good? Boy, it wasn't that good, their testimony. They were only, look at that, isn't that good? It is as it is possible. As much as it is, depends on you. Live peaceable with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to people's anger. For as it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy's hungry, go ahead and feed him. You might have to give him the dish and run, okay? But if he is thirsty, give him to drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Now, I always used to believe, but most people do about that. You actually put a coal of fire on their head and it's going to burn their brain. No. The only time I realized what was going on is when I was in Haiti, the people needed coals to cook their meal. And they would go everywhere to look for coals. And if somebody gave you a pot of coals on your head, that was them spreading the fire that they had to your coals not burning your head. They were giving you the means to cook your food. You see the difference? Not frying the brain. <laughs> God's going to put coals of fire on their head. Yeah. Okay, you with me? And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with... Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Quickly... One, be genuine in love, hate what is evil, let people know where you're at. Two, be diligent, fervent in attitude, serving the Lord, patient in tribulation, rejoicing in hope, steadfast in prayer, giving the needs to the saints, and be hospitable. Third, bless those that persecute you. Don't curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Associate with the humble and not the puffed up. And don't be wise in your own opinion. For repay no man evil for evil. Have respect to good things in life. Respect to others. And as much as we can, be peaceable among your brethren. Christians, don't take matters in your own hands. Let God do that. You forgive and release. Right? Don't be proud do good instead, and by not repaying evil for evil. Feed them, give them to eat, buy them a gift, do something nice. Why? Because that's what you really, you, we need, because it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, isn't it? And do not be overcome by evil, but rather overcome evil with good. Amen. Bless you for letting me go over a little bit. Did you get some out of that?